Hello, and welcome back to the Retro Robo Boy channel, where today we are reviewing the first TV show I have ever covered on this channel, which must mean it's really significant and a really great show, right? Right? Oh, shit. Yeah, this is probably going to be a weird one. If you clicked on this video, you most likely know Yu Yu Hakusho. But just in case you don't, and you've been living under an anime rock, well, let me cover the basics. Yu Yu Hakusho is an acclaimed battle action manga that ran in Jump Comics, also known as Shonen Jump, between the years 1990 and 1994. Many of you might already be intimately familiar with the author, Yoshihiro Togashi, who's the same mangaka who created Hunter x Hunter. And of course, you can't bring up Togashi without also mentioning that his wife is the creator of Sailor Moon. Talk about a power couple. And with any popular manga, of course, there's an anime adaptation. The original Yu Yu Hakusho anime ran from 1992 to 1994. However, many of us Western fans are more familiar with the show from the early 2000s Toonami run on Cartoon Network and Adult Swim. And while technically my first anime is probably Pokemon and Dragon Ball, Yu Yu Hakusho might have been the first anime I really kept up with on a week-to-week -week basis. I remember how excited I was to come home from school and watch it, and I think a lot of kids born in the 90s remember Yu Yu Hakusho as just being one of those really cool, really edgy shows that was way different from anything else that came out at the time. You had badass teenage punks for main characters, you had cool fights with demons, there was gory and bloody moments, plenty of cursing, super funny jokes. I mean, the dub was just absolutely incredible. Haven't seen this many freaks since that comic book convention. Winner, Kuwabara. I guess Kuwabara won't be so easy to beat from now on, huh? <laughs> well, at least he's still ugly. Ah, got him! A gentleman, a pawn of insecure males seeking to own their women. Whoa, whoa, I don't know anything about that, okay? Guys just don't fight girls. I'll fight with you. You're messy, are you serious? She's a fighter and she's trying to get in our way. I don't care if she's a girl or a baby or somebody's grandmother. I'll still knock her out. <laughs> We all know Kuwabara had the best voice. You're a messy. It was just so good. I think I speak for a lot of guys when saying Keiko might actually be one of my first anime crushes. But above all else, I think the show really set itself apart with its first episode. I mean, opening the very first scene of the very first episode with the death of your main character is so ballsy. And especially as like a seven or eight year old kid, I mean, just blew our minds. I still have fond memories of going up to 7-Eleven every weekend just to get a Slurpee and a pack of Yu Yu Hakusho trading cards. I even had a Yu Yu Hakusho lunchbox, and I still wonder what happened to that thing to this day. I mean, if you couldn't tell by the shirt, Yu Yu Hakusho is one of my favorite anime, and honestly, it's probably in my top three. So when word got out a couple years ago that they were developing a live-action Yu Yu Hakusho for Netflix, a lot of us were really worried, and rightfully so. I mean, live-action anime has a reputation for being absolute doo-doo dog shit. I mean, even more so than your average comic book or novel adaptation. For whatever reason, they never seem to be able to get it right. Well, with the exception of a few entries that I can bring up, I mean, the live-action Death Notes from Japan, not the Netflix version, I think are pretty damn good. I mean, if I have to be honest, I have a guilty pleasure for the live-action Speed Racer. And speaking of Toonami, definitely can't leave out the live-action Roroni Kenshin trilogy. I mean, those might actually be the best anime adaptations ever. And just to throw in an absolute wild card, I'm one of the few psychopaths on the planet who actually likes the live-action Dragon Ball. What the fuck? And no, not that horrible atrocity with Justin Chatwin. I'm talking about the illegally made bootleg Taiwanese live-action Dragon Ball that was shot in Thailand. If you haven't seen Dragon Ball The Magic Begins, can you even really call yourself a Dragon Ball fan? And I have many regrets about this channel so far, but one of the biggest ones is that I never got around to covering the live-action One Piece that came out last year. I gotta say, if I gotta wrap it up real quick in a neat little bow, I was very pleasantly surprised. Was it perfect? No. But you could definitely tell they put in the money, and everyone who was in there was definitely very much in love with the source material and they really wanted to make something special and that really came through and we started to see what hopefully is the beginning of a new renaissance of live action anime adaptations. The director of this production is Sho Tsukikawa and I looked him up on IMDb. I don't recognize anything he's done. I have no opinion about him so I have no preconceived bias on how this is going to turn out nor was anyone in the cast really familiar to me and I tried to avoid the trailers but whenever they released the first promo photos 
I was a little worried. I mean, just look how they massacred my boy Kuwabara. Why couldn't they give him the cheesy greaser haircut? Yeah, I know, it's a little dated. But hell, the show takes place in the 90s, and even then that haircut was dated. That's kind of the whole point. He's a classic Japanese high school delinquent. It's just part of the look. It's iconic, you gotta keep the pompadour. But I was ready to get over the side shave and give them the benefit of the doubt. I didn't wanna hate it prematurely, so I went in cautiously optimistic. With all that preamble out of the way, did this break the live action anime curse and actually give us something good for once? Well, let's do some spare detective work and find out. Roughly translated into English, Yu Yu Hakusho means Poltergeist Report. So naturally, the story follows the beginnings of a spirit detective. At first glance, our young hero, Yusuke Urameshi, is just another street punk who can't seem to keep his head on straight. But one faithful day, he shows his true colors when he selflessly sacrifices his life to save a boy from a speeding car. The reality quickly hits him that he is now a ghost and he is ready to face the afterlife. But he is greeted by a quirky and charming Grim Reaper by the name of Botan, who lets him know that his death was completely unexpected and there were in fact no plans for him in the afterlife. Seizing the opportunity to take advantage of a bold and courageous young man, it is decided that he will become a spirit detective and help battle the forces of the underworld that roam the land of the living and it is on this action-packed spiritual journey that he befriends his longtime rival, Kuwabara, who is sensitive to the paranormal, as well as joining up with two other unlikely companions, who are in fact demons themselves with their own personal motivations. The story chronicles their battles as these unlikely delinquents decide the fate of all humanity. The main cast comprises of Yusuke, played by Takumi Kitamura, Kuwabara, played by Shuhei Husuhi, Botan, played by Kotone Furukawa, Kurama, played by Jun Shison, and Hiei, played by Kanada Hongo. Now this is gonna be somewhat spoilery, so if you don't wanna go in with anything at all, you wanna be completely fresh, I would recommend skipping to this time zone where I just kind of sum up my overall review, but I am gonna get a little nitty gritty. I'll try and skip over some bigger details, but it's kind of gonna be hard to talk about the show without comparing it to the original. Now, this might seem somewhat of a superficial thing to bring up right from the start, but I gotta say, I was really hoping this would have one banger of an opening, but instead, it had no opening theme song. And I know, it's a live action adaptation, this isn't the anime, but Smile Bomb has to be one of the best anime openings ever. I think it's my personal favorite, even over Evangelion or so many other classics. It just has such a funky groove to it. And I will say they do make a little Easter egg and it is very cute uh, with the song in it, but it just didn't hit. And there's also no real cool ending theme. And that's one thing I gotta say is that from the start, just translating it into live action already gave it somewhat of a different feel. I will say right off the bat that Takumi Kiramura really won me over as far as portraying Yusuke, even though these kids don't look anywhere near middle school age like they are in the original show. Even in the original show, I always had a problem with how young they were. They seemed a little too young for how they acted and, and, for, and for their height and their physique. So them aging up to high school definitely doesn't bother me in this. And as far as the cast that they have in here, um, you know, there is a little bit of that, you know, Spider-Man, Sam Raimi effect where all the high schoolers look a little too old, but it didn't bother me. I was able to buy into it. Since this is more fantastical anime world, it really didn't bother me. One small detail I noticed that I really appreciate is the fact that Yusuke Urameshi is actually smoking. Uh, a lot of people might not know if you didn't read the manga, but in the original source material, he would always go up to the roof of the school to smoke, but in the anime version, they had to censor this out, so they just, they just have him chewing some gum or something like that. So it was kind of nice to see them pay attention to these little details, and it, it, it's something that I appreciated. It's also kind of nice that they toned down some of the more pervy aspects. Um, I, you know, what's okay in, in an anime or in a, in, a, in a manga in the 80s and 90s. When translated into live action in modern day, it's just so ridiculous and honestly so cringy. So I'm, I'm happy that they made Yusuke a, a, a less grabby and weird with Keiko. But even from these opening moments, it was hitting all the beats, but I could tell from the get-go, this was going really fast. Uh, you know, sh they had the show Yusuke was a cool guy, and so they had him, you know, fighting with some bullies and stuff but it really felt like they were skimming over, but there was this really excellent, really funny introduction shot where they first have Kuwabara come in and Yusuke kicks all their asses. Uh, it was just ugh, gold, perfect. But when we eventually make our way back around to the fatal car crash, I was very taken back 
by the fact that they were mixing in an element from much, much later in the show that I almost forgot about, where there's this giant portal that's opening up in the ground to uh, the dark world, and there's all these little demonic insects that are possessing people. So in this version, instead of having it be a husband and wife who just weren't paying attention and accidentally hit Yusuke, it's, it's actually a guy who's possessed by a monster, and it kind of ties the story in ties it into this demonic element from the beginning instead of it just seeming seeming, seeming like just just random accident it, it's it's a byproduct of this demonic attack and you know for some people that might bother them but it didn't really bother me um i would have actually liked to see a little bit more of the cute interaction between yusuke and the little boy that he saves but you know it, it's just a little thing but damn that scene when he gets hit by a car holy shit <laughs> That looks way too realistic. I don't know what they were thinking. I mean, it was awesome. It was great. But man, they dialed up that that that, that, that car crash up to 11. Holy shit. They threw Yusuke under the bus and killed his ass. We're then introduced to another fan favorite, Botan, played by Otone Furukawa. And I think she is the embodiment of Botan. She does a wonderful job. She is so charming, so delightful. She has this dark sense of humor. She's playful, but also very wise. And she really does feel like, you know, this, this kind of cute Grim Reaper character. But it really, really bugged me that she does not fly on an oar. I mean, what the fuck is that about? I'm assuming it has to do with budget or time constraints, or maybe it looked goofy, but I'm like, they have people shooting laser blasts and auras out their hands. They have fully rendered giant CGI demon monsters. They got people transforming, doing backflips. Is it really that hard to make people fly on an oar? I mean, they had Harry Potter flying on a broom in 2001. Is it really that hard in the year 2023 to have a lady flying on a wooden stick? Is it really that expensive? It just, it, I know it's a little thing, but when she ever she teleported in, I was like, wait a minute, where's the part where he looks above him? And oh, there she is just flying above. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a cute, cute setup they have with them flying around the city. And so much of that first chunk of, of Yu Yu Hakusho, that, that slice of life episodic moment of them doing afterlife type shit. It's just them flying around. Why didn't they have them fly around? I, I don't care if it was expensive or whatever. It's no excuse. It, it's really no excuse to, to leave Botan's most iconic look out. Her flying on the oar really should have been in this show. And I don't care if it's a small thing. To me, it, it bugged me a lot. But as far as her performance goes, loved it. Perfect. But then it got even more disappointing when they finally introduced Koenma. Koenma is no longer a little baby man. Yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. I mean, again, I know that it's, it's you know, child labor laws are tricky and you can only have child actors for so long. But considering that this character doesn't have that much screen time, was it really that difficult to have, you know, a, a younger actor play him? It didn't have to be a literal baby. You don't have to have some creepy CGI monstrosity, you know, sucking on a pacifier or anything like that. I think they could have easily settled for a younger aged actor and they could have even dubbed over him because he would have a you know pacifier in his mouth but instead they go for the glow up version where he's already an adult from the get-go and again i get i get why they might want to do that but for me so much of the humor comes from yusuke being so surprised that this deity is a child even though he's actually been around for thousands of years um and and the fact that we don't get to see that glow up is kind of annoying uh but again something small and really, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't really hurt the story. It's just something where if you're a fan of the original, it's going to bug you. Another thing I need to mention is how they pretty much cut out all of the ghost stuff from that first section of the show. After Yusuke dies, he has these little actual, kind of almost like mini missions, like little side quests to try and get back into his body. It takes a while. It takes about, I want to say, in the manga, it takes even longer. But in the anime, they, they, they abridged it a little bit. And it takes probably about a week or so for him to finally get back into his body. So he has to have Keiko and his mother and Kuwabara kind of take after his body. He has to do possessions and do all these crazy little hijinks. And there's this awesome midnight kiss, you know, kind of like this, um, this Sleeping Beauty Cinderella type episode that that a lot of people love a lot of like romantic drama and cute high school slice of life stuff they they just basically completely trimmed all the fat 
but that fat is what added the flavor uh, to this beautiful steak of a show. So it, it definitely bugged me. Um, and, and I think what, what hurt even more is that when it finally did come around to Yusuke coming back to the living world, in the original, they had this whole side plot, which, which ended up being really important later. He needs to nurture this golden egg in order to come back to Earth. However, if he has all this horrible negative energy, it feeds off of that and will turn into a giant beast and basically eat him and send him to hell. So the stakes were pretty high when he was given this egg. And so there's an episode where there's, you know, the house is on fire and Yusuke's body's going to burn and Keiko runs in and completely selflessly runs in to go save his body. Um, so, you know, it was basically risking her life to save this boy that she loves. And it's this really heroic moment. But knowing that it's his last chance to come back to the living world, he throws it into the fire, sacrificing his chance to come back in order to save her. And it's this really just heroic moment. It shows a lot about his character and really shows how these two characters care so much about each other. But in this version, she still runs in to save him. But then she ends up getting stuck and so he just ends up coming back anyways out of nowhere to save her. It completely robs all the agency away from her and he carries her out of the building all like sexy and heroic and shit. He's like, come back to life. And it's like, it kind of just undermined Keiko's character and also just made his return a lot more lame. And there's just significantly less fight to get back. It didn't feel as earned. And that kind of bugged me. And then it immediately followed up by a really really badass battle i'm not gonna lie <laughs> it felt like i was just going more and more downhill but what saved it was the first battle of this show damn do they know what they're doing here we gotta give it up to the goat and that's the fight choreographer whose name is kenji tanagaki this man is brilliant and it's funny because earlier in this review i mentioned the roroni kenshin trilogy and those samurai fights are so bad ass and this guy is the same guy who choreographed those films and you can tell the camera work the lighting the quick whips and pans never get disorienting it's always done just at the right moment to emphasize your hits to emphasize your your flips and and and, and the the fight is clear you can tell that that the actors know what they're doing they really let you savor every punch it's bloody it's it's brutal you know they're they're using the 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 environment around them i mean it feels like legit street martial arts meets anime it is the best anime action i've ever seen in live action i think ever outside of Rurouni kenshin and that's a big deal and for as much as i liked the one piece adaptation the fights in that show got nothing on this trust me i gotta say the way they handle the demons and supernaturalness are also very much tapping into the more horror aspect of that manga and they're just they're not afraid to get bloody and nasty and gross and i really appreciated that it made the fights feel so much more tangible and gross and just damn it was so badass but i'm also happy to report that the humor is still here while it doesn't hit quite as hard as watching the funimation dub back in the day and you know it isn't as silly as the anime there's still a fair amount of humor in this and they still kind of balance that youthful feeling with the more heavy, darker action. What really put a smile on my face was the second battle that they introduced when Yusuke fights Goki. This puts so many Marvel movie fights to shame because you have this fully CGI creature, right? And it's not like the most photo real CGI in the world, but man, when he's tearing up these cars, barely missing Yusuke's head, and Yusuke's like hiding in a car to get away from this big fucker, and there's just, it is so good. I mean, the fight choreography in this is just mm, so good. I really hope that One Piece season two takes after this show, and, and hopefully we can get more competently shot scenes, because I don't think the fight choreography in One Piece was bad. I think it's more so the way that it was shot. It didn't really show off the work that they put into it. But I think now would be a good time to squeeze in one more nitpick that's going to ring true for a lot of Yu Yu Hakusho fans. Now, Yu Yu Hakusho is a product of the 90s, and as such, it had a lot of 90s fashion. And, you know, if you, if you know anything about manga covers or, or chapter art, manga, especially things like Bleach, are known for having really cool drip. 
I mean, really great fits. And Yu Yu Hakusho has some iconic fits. I mean, especially back in the day in like the Tumblr days or whatever. Even nowadays on Instagram and stuff, you'll see a lot of people post screenshots from Sailor Moon, from Bleach, and uh, Yu Yu Hakusho. And it's just the fits were so cool. You know, Yusuke had his, his big jacket. He had the sunglasses. And this show, it's funny. It's almost more anime than the anime because they never once take off their school uniforms from beginning to end. Maybe they'll have a tank top on when they're training, but really that's it. It, it, it. They completely lost the flavor and style that these characters had when they weren't in school. And that's something I was really looking forward to seeing is like all these cool fits in the 90s fashion. And it's just completely missing. I know, again, another nitpick, but those little details do go a long way. And I think it would have been nice just to see, you know, Yusuke wear some sunglasses. Yu Hakusho isn't the same without the drip. I'm sorry. Speaking of bad fits, it's time to move on to Kurama's wig. Bruh, look at this dude. Ah, look at the top of his head. <laughs> he really just threw a red wig on the guy and, and <laughs> chopped his bangs. We're like, yep, there you go. There's just no getting around it. Kurama's wig is whack as fuck. But I'm happy to say that they got his story right, and overall, I think the actor that they chose is perfectly fine. He did a great job, uh, you know, working with what little time he had in the show. And I actually think that the introduction of Kurama was handled pretty damn well. And I don't mind that they uh, had Kuwabara kind of reintroduced into that, because I think that with, with the runtime this show had... It made sense to kind of compile those stories together, seeing that they were going to work together anyways. And another detail I really appreciate is that they actually have Yusuke help him save his mom, like he did in the original manga, by sacrificing half of their life together. While in the anime version, they did change that detail to where the magic mirror basically says, oh, since you tried to do a good deed, you're going to get off scot-free. And it's like, that's kind of stupid. So I'm really happy that this show returned the original origin of Yusuke and Kurama working together to save Kurama's mom. But while Kurama had a pretty decent showing in this series, they did our boy Hiei dirty. I'm sorry, but Hiei is such a cool character in the original. He really is the Vegeta of Yu Yu Hakusho. I mean, for one, he looks exactly like him. But secondly, he had that same character arc where he starts off as this big bad villain, this boss battle that they had to get over. And he's such a vicious, selfish guy. But then you learn that he has more of a soft side. He has a sister that he's looking to, 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 to rescue and that he cares deeply for, even though he's a demon. And he, he kidnaps Keiko, and it's like this whole big thing, and it's like this epic showdown. Um, and it's the first time you have Kurama and Yusuke work together to take down this big bad. And I was really looking forward to that scene playing out, but they just completely, completely overhaul it in this dumb way involving the Taguro brothers. I won't get into it into, in, too into depth, but it really just kind of fell flat for me. And I gotta say... I think the first two and a half episodes are great. They're really good. Even though I've complained about some of the things that they've taken out, have some nitpicks, as a show on its own, especially for someone who hasn't watched the original in years, I was really digging it. I was really sinking my teeth in. But I think it's once they introduce the Taguro brothers and the, and the larger overall plot starts to go into play and this mixture and concoction of different sagas starts to really collapse in on itself around the third or fourth episode. Speaking of doing characters dirty, unfortunately we now have to talk about Genkai. I thought it was funny that they introduced her with a rap song just out of nowhere. There aren't any needle drops in this show until this point and as, for, as far as complaining about not having enough funky music, Gotta say, they just drop a funky beat out of nowhere, so I guess they get points there. And this might be a controversial opinion, but I actually don't mind the fact that they skipped the opening games uh, that Genkai holds, because it always felt like just this weird prototype for the Hunter exam, which was a far superior version of that same opening game. I think the idea of Genkai just training Yusuke and Kuwabara from the get-go because of dire circumstances to me makes way more sense. Sure, it took away some of the mystery mystique of the character, but honestly, that wasn't even the best part about her character. And for what training sequences we did get, uh, I thought it was pretty good. You know, Genkai always was the master Roshi of the Yu Yu Hakusho franchise in a sense. And so to get to see Yusuke, Kuwabara, 
Botan and Genkai spend a little bit of time together, uh, unlike uh, in the original show where they kind of skip over that. I thought that was kind of neat, but holy shit, it was not enough for the grand scheme of things. Because yes, the Genkai versus Yusuke battle, when she's throwing nuts in his face and stuff, that shit was hilarious. I loved it. Yo, watch this fucking move. Watch this crab walk shit. Look at this shit. Ooh. What? Ooh. Damn, and she got the nuts? Oh, mm. Mm. But the fact that you basically only get one training montage, and that is the entirety of what her character is boiled down to in this show, I mean, at this point, why even have her in there at all? You have no time to get emotionally invested or connected to her. Uh, you know, you don't get to see the, the the bond between those characters and really when shit hits the fan and if you've seen the show whether the original or, or this version you know what i'm referring to it falls flat you feel nothing i mean you really are just like okay uh smell you later oh man i completely forgot that about the de-aging effects they do some really creepy weird deep fake de-aging effects on genkai whenever they're doing flashbacks or younger sequences i'm like just hire a younger actress it's not that hard Man, that face was creeping me out. It was Uncanny Valley out the ass. She was probably the scariest looking thing in this whole show outside of Elder Taguro. But you know what? Even after all of this, even after skipping all these things and doing all these random little changes, I still was thoroughly enjoying this show until I realized, wait a minute. They are completely bypassing the Dark Tournament arc. That is is unforgivable hell no the dark tournament arc is the greatest tournament arc in all of anime history outside of the tenkaichi budokai tournaments from dragon ball it has so many raw emotional moments it has the humor it has the badass powers it's just everything you could possibly want in a tournament based saga all wrapped up in the one and some dipshit who was writing this decided it was a good idea to just completely omit that and make this little mini baby tournament and it just sucks i mean yeah it looks really cool but it essentially it's just this really ugly like greatest hits compilation at this point you know you have your squad of four main characters and none of them feel like they're close except for Kuwabara and Yusuke, that relationship, I think, works very well in this show. You have Genkai, who's just there to say, Oh, here, learn this attack. Okay, bye, peace. And you have the Taguro brothers, who, in my opinion, look great. They're creepy as shit. And Team Taguro, overall, looks exactly like the anime, and they translated them very well into live action. But this just ended up feeling like a shit-ass squid game. <laughs> like a shit-ass battle royale. Um... It just it had no emotional weight. It, it fell completely flat, and I wanted it to be this cool, epic finale, but the power scaling is just completely broken. There's no time to take it all in, and it just it just really let me down. I mean, the only saving grace I can say is that it had been so long since I've seen the original that I was kind of able to detach myself and just kind of enjoy it for what it was, but I know for a fact if I hadn't seen the original show, I wouldn't know what the fuck is going on. And I'd be really curious to see if anyone here who's watching this had never seen the anime before and just watched this for the first time. Let me know how you thought about it. Did you enjoy it? Were you able to, to take all the information in? Did you notice or feel like there was giant missing pieces? Because, I mean, when you start introducing characters' transformations, when you literally just got introduced to these characters... Is it really a transformation or is it just a new bag of tricks that just came up out of nowhere? I did a little bit of research and apparently the whole reason why this show was made the way it was is because it was very expensive to produce and it was also very lengthy. I think it was almost five years worth of production from beginning to end to get this show out and they realized that they probably wouldn't have enough time with the actors, with the contracts and all that to actually fulfill the entire series. So what they settled for was instead having some of the most iconic moments bunched up into one big package and basically just making it like a fan service fan film. And at that point, why even make this show at all? I mean, I know they have to remake shit 
because it's a popular name they can cash in on the money but you could tell the ingredients were here i mean the the, the overall base that they were working with as far as having the cast the effects everything was there to make the perfect adaptation i think that's what's so frustrating about this is there are so many things about it that are so cool and that do work and that really feel like the original show i love the cast i love the special effects but it just man they just blew their load too early in a weird way it's almost worse than a just complete dog shit adaptation because at least with dragon ball evolution you can just laugh at it you can just be like this is so bad and so painful and the cringe is so so unbearable that it almost does a complete 180 and makes it entertaining this it's just missed opportunity after missed opportunity, and it almost makes it sting more because there is a lot to love here. There is a lot to like, and for what it's worth, I actually do think there's a lot of entertainment value to be had here. There's this great moment towards the end where Kuwabara runs into Yuki and he falls in love, and it was just a super goofy, funny moment, and it completely reminded me of the anime, and it's just these little moments here and there, and the battles, and some of the some of the aesthetic quality with the CG, and I'm just like, you had it! You had Yu Yu Hakusho in your hands, and you just, you fumbled it, you dropped the ball. If I were to go back in time and fix this, there's one very simple solution. Keep it five episodes with an hour long each. You don't have to change that. Keep the cast, keep the same budget, but instead of making it about the Toguros and about the demon world and all this other bullshit, just make it about Hiei. That's right. Completely rewrite the whole thing to where Hiei is the big bad. He is the final boss. He is the main villain. So you have the entire show about Yusuke, you know, getting back to his body, becoming buddy buddies with Kuwabara, meeting Kurama, and seeing that some demons aren't so bad, and then having the entire thing be the final battle in that warehouse against Hiei, the super powerful demon. He's got the transformation of all the eyeballs after, all over him. You got Keiko. You know, throughout the show, you got time to really get attached to Keiko, so when she gets kidnapped at the end, it's like this big epic thing, and then the final battle, you know, you defeats Hiei and Hiei is limping away licking his wounds and it's like a you know this setup for the second season when you have this you know the setup for this rematch with Hiei but it, as we know it's not going to be a rematch they're going to become buddies and and then you can introduce Genkai at the beginning and there boom your second season you, you know compiling 10 or 12 episodes worth of material down in the five hour long episodes is completely doable yes you'd still have to cut some stuff out but again with this cast with the effects and with the, with the fight choreography you could have easily told that story about yusuke versus kurama uh goki and hiei that is totally doable it would have been perfect it would have been a great start to this franchise but of course no they can't do that they just have to pile all this shit literally <laughs> like a hundred plus episodes worth of material down into five hour long episodes it was inevitable that this was going to turn out to be a complete mess and you know what i guess having a beautiful mess is better than having an ugly mess you know if i had to make a food analogy because i know people always hate when i do this but i can't help it i always think of food this is like a really well fried crispy chicken but that has no seasoning and has super dry meat. <laughs> the meat doesn't got the juice. It doesn't got the spices. It's like, yeah, this batter's crunchy. Mmm, that's pretty crunchy. I like that mouthfeel, but everything else sucks. So this, at the end of the day, it's just junk to fill my stomach. It's another piece of product. It is content meant to be dumped on Netflix. And you know, it sucks when you have something that simultaneously feels like a cash grab, but also has bits of art sprinkled and I gotta say, Taguro in his final transformation form, I think looks pretty good. I know some people think he looks creepy because he's got a floating head on a CGI body, and some people think it looks like shit, but I think it was a decent adaptation of that, that final transformation, and I thought that fight was still pretty badass. 
even though you lose a lot of the context and weight. But I've gone on too long complaining, so let's just wrap this shit up with my final thoughts. The casting in this was great. I had no complaints about anybody, even though a lot of them just didn't get enough time to shine. Fights in this are a 10 out of 10, better than any other anime fights I've seen other than Roroni Kenshin, and that is very high praise. I think the CGI looks absolutely fantastic in most scenes, and at worst, it's just mid-level CGI. It never was distracting or just got awful. I applaud the show for being willing to have a darker tone and be full of gore and blood, even more so than the anime. It was a delight to see all the explosive gory moments, but ultimately this fails because of god-awful pacing and just a horrible amount of stuff shoved into way too few of episodes. And to top it all off, it was really missing the music. The music in that original show was perfect. This version just used really generic, forgettable techno music here and there. And I gotta say this right now, not to sound like a boomer, but this is to all the kids out there. At least I think it's the kids. I see y'all in the comments complaining about One Piece saying how it's one of the worst adaptations ever made. Man, shut the hell up. You don't know what you're talking about. The One Piece adaptation, even if you don't like it, even if you don't think it's perfect, they you can tell they love that shit. They tried, they put their... Their, their elbow grease into that. That is a genuine loving adaptation of that material. They tried their best and I think they did great. It's a perfectly enjoyable show. It's a great show of great acting, great casting, great effects. You don't know bad shit. You did not have to suffer for Dragon Ball Evolution. You have no idea what it's like to watch the thing you love just be completely shit on. I mean, Goku is a nerdy high school teen who gets beat up by bullies and has perverted fantasies about Chi Chi sucking on a strawberry in math class. I mean, what the fuck? Come on, man. I mean, really, what were they thinking? Don't even get me started. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm fuming. Don't, I don't ever want to hear people complain about One Piece ever again. Just say you didn't like it. That's it. It's not a bad adaptation. Not by any means. So let's go ahead and slap a rating on this baby. You know, if again, zero being so bad it's offensive, 10 being masterpiece, and five being mid, I do think that this has plenty of entertainment value when it comes to the action scenes. And again, I can tell that they did try, and it really just feels like they were constrained behind the scenes and i think that if the best way to watch this is if you haven't watched yu yu hakusho in many many years if it's just a childhood show you remember then i think this is going to be a fun ride for you to have if you just shut off your brain enjoy seeing the fights in live action and really just look at it as like a fun youtube fan film which is it doesn't sound like great praise but all in all i don't regret watching this and if they decide to make a, a season two, whatever, you know, weird Frankenstein concoction of a story that ends up being, I enjoy this just enough because of the cast, I'd be willing to watch it. So with that being said, I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna be generous. I'm gonna give this a six out of 10. I almost said 6.5, but no, I'm gonna give it a six out of 10. It's just above mid. It, you know, it's, it's better than most live action anime adaptations, but that's a really low bar to meet. Um, so again, watch it for the action scenes. And if anything, you could just watch the good parts on YouTube and clips, and I think you'll get the full experience. But if you do end up watching the whole thing, I don't think this is bad enough to be offensive. It doesn't completely shit all over the original. It just is a big missed opportunity. Because when you really think about it, the original show is just this wholesome boy story. You know, it's about it's about you and the guys getting together and kicking some ass and saving the day. And I think this just missed that mark. You don't feel like you're a part of that gang. You don't get that time to really love these guys. And that's really ultimately how it fails. And if anything good came out of this, it did reignite my excitement for Yu Hakusho Show and maybe go back and watch that original show I love so much. So you know what? Maybe you guys should go back and do the same. But until next time, thank you so much for watching. Due to the Urameshi team fighting without rest, and in accordance to Section 13 of the Tournament Index, report to the medical tent. As long as they don't grab my balls and make me cough. Scratch that.